one, two, one, two. We're getting ready to talk about what it means to be wonderfully made. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Revolution Will Be live stream. I'm your host, TK Coleman. And today we are going to be talking to the inimitable Fifi Buchanan. So Fifi started her career off as a mechanical engineer. She's worked as a copywriter, a content creator, and a voice artist. And she still does all those things, but she also is the host of the Wonderfully Made podcast. As a wellness expert, she helps people optimize their lives for healing and health. If you haven't heard of her, follow her on Instagram and Twitter. She's constantly sharing some really uh, brilliant insights, some really encouraging insights. And one thing I like about Fifi is that she has this really rare and powerful combination of vulnerability and power. When she speaks, she speaks with the authority, presence, and conviction of someone who has truly done the inner work, but she speaks with this empathy and compassion of someone who's never forgotten the things that she's had to come through and the things that she goes through today. So please welcome to our show, Fifi Buchanan. Fifi, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I, I listened to you on the Deconstruct podcast, and one thing I didn't know about you is that you you said how your father became a pastor when you were only 10 years old, and that mm -hmm. had a pretty big impact on your life, and yeah. Christian spirituality played a big role on your childhood. So I would love to to know about that background. Tell us a little bit about your story, your faith, and how that led to where you are today. Yeah, so growing up in church has definitely like impacted my life in a lot of ways, just made me mindful of how I live and I would say how I how, how I impact others, what my interaction is. And so, and then I've also just grown up not from church, but just I'm a very sensitive person. Like, I, I don't know if you've heard of the book, Highly Sensitive People, but it's just an interesting take on, you know, about 10% of the population that just happens to be extremely sensitive. And so um, over the years, I've had a good relationship with my parents. I've had a lot of really interesting talks, but I'm also the oldest child. So I feel like sometimes when you're the oldest child, you can tend to be a little bit of a people pleaser, a bit of a perfectionist. And that combination can sort of put somewhat of a veil over your personality and kind of where you're going because you're so concerned with, well, what will others think and who will I disappoint? And this path others have laid out for me seems good. Maybe I should just follow that. And so uh, just more in recent years, I'd say like the past decade, learning to doubt myself less and really tap into my intuition. Because when I think back, uh, there are times when I did not listen to it and it was spot on. And I would say that spirituality played a huge part in that, just um, tapping into my relationship with God and then letting that define who I am, even if that's different from my parents or grandparents or friends or mentors or whoever's, you know, they really have good intentions, of course, but it might not be where I'm meant to go. And that's not a vision they were given. It's something that I was given. And I think I'm, I'm grateful too, that the, the household that I grew up in, um, we try to be really non-judgmental and not like imposing our beliefs on other people. So I entered the world that way, knowing that, yeah, a ton of people think differently from me and I can listen to them and see where they're coming from and see how best to support them and honor them in their journey. So I grew up, you know, as uh, back when people still did like knocking on doors for, for sales or for like evangelism. And my dad let everybody in, whoever was coming to chat about their background, he would just listen. It didn't necessarily mean he had to agree, but he just wanted to like give them a chance to talk. So I think that's impacted me today to like, just know that everybody has a story and try to tap into that because I think people really enjoy telling their story. One of the things that, go go ahead, Kamal, I see. Yeah, I'm just having some technical difficulties here, but yeah, I'm ready to roll. Uh, Fifi, I was gonna ask you about your your, your past, kind of like growing up in, 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 in the family dynamic in which you grew up in. I think what I find is that a lot of people who are really into wellness and healing um, usually grew up in a space that wasn't super conducive to that. And so I, I'd like to kind of hear about how you made this transition into the space you're in now and, and what motivated that shift, if it was a shift indeed. 
Yeah, I think, well, I think there was a gradual change. One thing that impacted my journey was my mom going back to school to get her master's degree in public health. And so once she started learning more in the classroom and kind of changing her career, I think her background was like business before, um, she would change like how we ate at home. And at that time she had like shifted to becoming vegetarian and she would like, um, I think she just knows the way our minds work. So if we were eating like quinoa or something for the first time, she was like explaining, well, it's actually a hybrid between a grain and a seed and it has more protein than this. So it's kind of like you're getting all this background on what it is. So the first part of my journey started from the aspect of food and cooking, but then as I started to struggle with anxiety, mostly like that transition from high school to college, um, I feel like college can reveal um, areas that need to improve or areas that need to heal. And so for me, I did not realize there was anxiety right under the surface because I was able to function. And then, you know, you're home with your parents, so you have a good support system. Um, they're not going to let you be late to school or, you know, miss cross country practice. But then when you're on your own, it's like, wow, like, why am I forgetful? Oh, maybe because I'm overwhelmed. So then I started realizing I needed to combine something with food. You can't just like eat kale and like drink smoothies and then think, okay, my, my, all of my wellness is good. It was more like I'm eating well, but I still feel an increased heart rate and uh, mental fog and all these sorts of things. So now how can I, you know, do certain things in my, you know, physical body and for my mental health. So in college, I started doing yoga and that was definitely a bit controversial because coming from a Christian background, not for me personally, but just people finding out that I was doing it, it was like, oh, well, you know, that's, you know, not right. Like we don't do that. And, you know, even like just people on the internet that I didn't even know were messaging me to tell me, hey, sis, I don't know if you know, that's satanic, like you should not be doing that. Like people I'd never had a conversation with just because I mentioned it, but I knew the benefits. My body felt a release of tension and I felt this confidence because, you know, when you first start, yoga can be really, really hard. Like it, it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot on your muscles and also just your mental capacity to focus for an hour. So I knew the benefits, so I just ignored it. And I, I really noticed a huge difference. So I would say just like, it's been this gradual thing. And then I personally just have this sort of like resistance that I, you know, my whole purpose of my podcast existing and just me being in this space is this resistance of not seeing mental health as something that we need help for. I've heard people say, mm -hmm. oh, I was depressed for a while, but I was able to shake it off. You know, things like that. I was anxious, but you know, God is my strength and that helped me not be anxious anymore. Not realizing there's something physiologically happening. There are people who have lower serotonin levels, for instance, you know, just different things happening where they really just wake up feeling anxious for no reason. Life, nothing has happened and they're waking up feeling like they can't function. I hated that people weren't acknowledging that in and outside of the church, in and outside the black community, just different spaces I was in. The way people were talking about it was actually super harmful. And I remember like going to therapy and just feeling like, this is, this is incredible. The, this, you know, the, I've had a, quite a few therapists over the years, you know, moving different cities and different things and them saying, well, if you don't want to go the medication route, let's see what we can do for you. I'm not against the medication route either, by the way, but the fact that they sat down and listened to what my needs were, um, the fact that I have ADHD, that definitely plays into the manifestation of anxiety. And I heard that in women, ADHD actually manifests more as anxiety to the point where they actually get misdiagnosed um, for like a general anxiety disorder, but it's actually ADHD. And so having a therapist actually have part of our session be deep breathing exercises and him saying, hey, I noticed you're kind of breathing more in your chest, but not from your belly. Like, and I noticed your breathing is shallow. Let's, let's make sure we dedicate five minutes to that. So it's not that I'm giving therapy on my show or, or anything like that, but I'm saying, here's what I'm implementing that is really working. Here's what I can fall back on. Um, prayer and your religious faith is so important. But if I got cancer today, I would pray and I would go to the doctor and I would listen to their treatment plan. I would not just simply pray and do nothing. So the same should be true for our mental health. Yeah, you know, God gave us the intelligence, right? To understand how the body works and it's it's all part of it's all part of the same thing. But you know, I'm a I'm a PK myself. And so I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. I remember I read this book a long time ago by Florence Scovel Shan, and it's called Your Word is Your Wand. 
And she quotes scriptures all in the book, right? Power of uh, life and death is in the tongue. But she used the word wand, you know, which is magic. And I remember mm -hmm. I, I, I posted a quote from your word is your wand on social media. And I had a, a, a person from the church I, I grew up in send me a message and said, hey, you know, I'm really worried about you that you're reading a book called Your Word is Your Wand. So I, I know all about that. You grew up in a church. You have so many tools you discover that can help you create a better life. And there's just kind of like this dualistic thinking that makes makes people afraid. Well, you don't you don't want to go off the deep end. I, yeah. I want to ask you a follow up about mental health, though. W one topic that is very prevalent right now because we're in an election cycle is politics. Mm -hmm. And something that a lot of people are dealing with is the high level of stress and anger that comes from talking across the room to people who think differently. And a lot of political yeah. discussions are kind of reduced to, well, if you don't vote the way I vote, or if you don't believe what I believe or agree with me on this candidate, you don't get to be a good human being. I would love to know your take on how you can preserve and cultivate mental health during an election cycle where everybody's arguing about politics and we're constantly bombarded with advertisements and manipulative media telling us to be angry and to be afraid in either this direction or that direction, but just be angry and afraid in some direction. Yeah. What's your take? Well, the first thing I'll say, and I think we all have to really understand that our humanity is not up for debate and just sit on that. And so regardless of what we see online, um, what we hear, what people even close to us say, our, our humanity is not up for debate. And so, because I think it's triggering. I think sometimes we see things that can be really harmful, arguing for you know control of another person's body or control of where they live, control of how their healthcare goes, whatever it is. I think that's why it's so triggering, but if we can get to that place of knowing and believing that, regardless of what's happening around us, then that's helpful. Uh, the next thing is it's really, really tempting to read the comments. It's like where people hang out. There's different sites like Shade Room and TMZ and different things. And sometimes people just read the headline and then go straight to the comments. And you know, they've like, oh, I've got my popcorn ready. I wanna hear what people are saying. But think about how dangerous that is that before we've allowed ourselves to form our own opinion, we would like to hear the commentary of others for entertainment, to decide if we should, you know, how we should go, to decide who's right or wrong. I, I just feel that that's really dangerous. Even on a topic that I'm not an expert on, I can allow myself to have some form of, of opinion or um, listen to how I feel when I read the full article or watch the full video before just commenting. And I've even had people say, I didn't read the article, but blank. And I'm going, well, why are you here? What? How, you didn't read the article, but you're entering the discussion and I'm supposed to consume your commentary? That doesn't make sense. So I don't read the comments hardly at all, unless it's on my own page, because I definitely want to be responsive, but it can just be so dangerous. Um, and then the other thing is just watching our cons consumption level in general. A lot of people want to keep like, uh, you know, their blood pressure down, their cholesterol down, keep their weight down and different things. So we watch what we eat, but we need to watch what we consume. We're not meant to be watching the news four or five, six hours a day or having it in the background. And so I have to limit myself. And it's tough because all of us, we're talking because we are active in the digital space, you know, but things like Twitter. I love Twitter because there are lists. And so I can put, you know, 20 or 30 of my close friends on a list and just read their tweets. And then I can have a separate list for writers and then health and wellness experts. And I can go to those lists if I feel like tapping in. But I find that my main home feed on Twitter, even though I follow a few people, you just never know what can pop up there. And it can be really triggering. Um, I was chatting with my cousin yesterday about how violent, how hostile some of the things are we see online every single day. Uh, someone I follow who I, I unfollowed re immediately posted a person committing suicide. It, it, I don't know if it was necessary, like basically an accidental death uh, because they were on drugs and they were up, they climbed up on a crane and then they fell. And the person reposted it with a joke. And so I didn't know what the video was going to be about. And it was just like 10 seconds, but it was completely traumatizing. Like I was not okay for a couple of days because you saw it, you heard it. And then the fact that this person made a joke about a human life. And that's the kind of stuff sometimes you may see. Now I understand you run the risk of it being an echo chamber because you're following people you want to follow. 
but I just can't tap in at all times. I just can't go onto my feed and just take a risk of them showing me whatever ad they want to show me or someone's, you know, sometimes you see a tweet that wasn't even someone you follow. So I think just really being careful and then maybe you say, okay, well, I need to know what's going on. So for 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening, I'm going to tap in. Or maybe like, cause I, I'm more of a visual learner. And so I think seeing things visually can also be very traumatizing. I'll read my news, I'll read articles. I don't want to see any images, especially if it's about someone else being killed by the police. I do not want to see that video. I have no intention of watching it. And then also we need to communicate clearly to the people around us, do not send me that stuff. If, if someone is being disrespected or being killed by the police, don't send it to me. Uh, because sometimes people don't know and they think, well, this person is in the wellness space. They really probably want to know. It's, it's a little tricky saying it. I feel like I felt a little bad the first few times I did, but I feel good now because people are not just sending me random stuff. When I open it up, it's super um, offensive. So I think it's just that combination of um, tailoring your timeline and tailoring the conversations you're having to even say, hey, I'm not in the place to have a conversation right now because people can really get on some rants when it comes to politics and it can just be overwhelming. Fifi, I actually just spent some time before we got on the call here uh, watching The Social Dilemma. I'm a little late to the party on that. I, I, um, I'm like, what, a couple months late at that. But I think that, you know, for people like us, like you said, we spend so much time on these digital platforms. I, I know my job so much. It's frozen here. All right, it looks like there we go. Okay. Um, you and, said and I know my job. Curious, That's you got cut off. Yeah, I'm just curious. You, as a, a personality, as a digital personality, you know, how do you find that balance? I know. I know you just kind of spent some time elaborating on that, but I think for people who want to dive into the space that you're in, who want to become a podcast host, who want to develop their personal brand, you know, how do how do they find um, how do they find that balance? Because I think you want to. Pour, pour yourself into it. And I think you want to give it your all and you, you want your followers to feel that authentic you. Um, and that, that takes an investment of time, of energy, you know, of commitment. Um, and so, you know, just, I, I'd love to just hear how you strike that balance and, and how, you know, you've been able to find this healthy medium um, that works for you. Um, well, first of all, there are definitely still days that I don't get it right. Um, by nature, I'm a person who, if I'm if I love what I'm doing and I'm super focused, I can overdo it and look up and it's super late and I need to be getting more rest and that sort of thing. But I would say part of the balance comes from who is in my circle. I have you know really close friends and then I have like uh, colleagues that are other content creators that we can sort of work together, kind of create little think tanks when things come up, like. Um, thinking about shifting over and spending more time on Pinterest. Let's talk about it. Who knows about that, which in my case, it's me. I'm like the person who knows the ins and outs because I spend a lot of time on there. And then, you know, if I want to chat with someone else about a different platform or, hey, the holidays are coming up, you know, what will that look like in this particular time? I actually have a call coming up about that. Like, how do we navigate this space? So just having people that I can talk to um, about how to move is really helpful um, so that I'm not working it out online. There are some people when you read their posts, it's like, don't you have friends you can talk to so that you are not exploding on the internet like this? Like, you know, ranting about a client that disrespected them or something that they didn't like. It's because they don't have someone to talk to offline that that's happening, in my opinion. So I think the balance really comes from the people around you, helping you stay grounded, being able to listen to you. Like I like to send voice notes back and forth. There's plenty of posts I see online where I'm like, whoa, this this is wild, let's talk. And I don't necessarily feel the need to put my commentary out there online, but I do need to talk about it. So I think sometimes as content creators, we underestimate our need to have someone like pour into us and listen to us talk and make sure it's filtered by the time we get to the internet, because I'm really big on being professional. I really see this community as a privilege and however you think of cancel culture and all those sorts of things that part doesn't really matter to me like because sometimes you can do bad stuff and get away with it no because people are just like oh but we love them so there should be something on the inside of you that says i want to carry myself in a respectful manner 
And that's, you know, sometimes that's why you need to be able to vent to your friends. So when that maybe community member is a little rude, you don't just snap back. You talk to your friends and say, can you believe this? And they say, oh, that was so wrong. And then by the time you go to respond or ignore or whatever you do, you're not even worked up anymore. Um, because this space, you know, it can be really draining. And I think also just taking breaks, um, you know, whether it's like, you know, your podcast comes out in season. So you say, OK, I'm taking a three month hiatus. Let me tell my audience to enjoy what's already there, but I am not producing anything in this these next few months. It's saying no um, for the this is the first podcast interview I've taken in, I think, maybe two months because I was getting so many back to back that I was like, you know, this is really draining to me. And I actually want a little space to have to do a little more living. So I have more to talk about. So instead, I kind of will, you know, do a few and then take a couple months off. So it's just all about like, um, I know sometimes balance seems like it's this thing where you you do a bunch of little things excellently, but I see it as like focusing on one or two things and then stepping off from that and then focusing on this other thing and then stepping off from that. So there are times when I don't do any brand partnerships because I just don't really feel like I have that space to collaborate. And then I may do several, you know? So just, I think balance is, it's not just this perfect thing where it's like, I ate perfectly today, I drank enough water. You know, it's it, some stuff sometimes falls by the wayside and you have to kind of choose what you can be excellent at. And then the other things you just maybe have to get by sometimes. So. Yeah. Fifi, what does it mean to be wonderfully made? So I was very inspired by, by the scripture um, in Psalm 139 that talks about being fearfully and wonderfully made. So it comes from the concept of just the design of us as human beings is magnificent. And no matter how average or basic or less than you feel, it is an incredible thing to be breathing and your heart beating and you're not even thinking about it. And the fact that we are uttering these sounds and another person is understanding it. Like, do you ever think about language and how incredible that is that we can write down something or utter a sound and another person now ingests that and, and knows our thoughts and knows our feelings? Uh, it's just really incredible to be in existence. And so just taking that base level of being and letting that define our greatness instead of what we've done. Fifi, I'd love to hear you expand on you being able to tap into your intuition. I think that is something that I, I mean, I am here for. I'm 10 toes down for my intuition. <laughs> we actually had a guest uh, who we talked to a couple weeks ago, TK, who went as far as to name his intuition. Uh, he actually calls him Craig. And I thought that was a fantastic <laughs> idea because, you know, there's going to be times in your life where, where there is a fork in the road and, you know, your, your gut, your intuition, Craig, might have something to say and then your ego, maybe your head might have something to say. And so the way he described it was that it by naming his intuition, it's a lot easier to, to, to identify when it's trying to talk that Craig is mm -hmm. really trying to come through and say something and I'm going to choose to listen to Craig. And I, yeah, I was just here for that. So I'd love to hear you elaborate more about listening to your own intuition. I know, especially coming from, um, you know, a family that's deeply rooted in faith, you know, th there's these systems and there's these way of living and there's a set of values that really guide the way that you know, you were, you live by and that, and that the way you were raised. And I think when your intuition, feels like it's in conflict with that or feels like it's pushing you to do something else that you're being told, that's a tough place to be. So I'd, I'd love to hear you just talk more to our audience about that. Yeah, I think the first thing, because uh, what you said at the end there is so true, sometimes your intuition can be pushing you away from an entire value system that your life was built around. But I think at first it was scary, but now I'm realizing that intuition can really push you away from religion but it can push you into relationship. Um, because I think the problem with the way some people do their relationship with God is it's just based on regurgitating things and it's it doesn't come from any experiential knowledge. And I think at some point, if you've been practicing something, whatever it is, um, you should get to a point where you can do it intuitively. So I would compare like your religious practice to cooking. And you know how in the beginning, 
you have to read a recipe and even reading the recipe and following it is clumsy and you can't remember which tape which is a tablespoon and which is a teaspoon and you know you you don't know like intuitively that hey i need to mix my dry ingredients over here and my wet ingredients first but then when some years go by you start to know and even when something is baking you can tell by the smell of it that it is ready without even the timer going off and then you go further and you're like at this place where you kind of don't even need a recipe you start to just throw things together and it's like you can't even really define what the ingredients are you're just like i just know based on the way i like it and the way it works and i think that our spiritual uh relationship with god should be that same way where we stop having our nose in the book and just reading the Bible literally and being able to interpret and go beyond that. And so I think that's the place I'm in now and realizing that's there's actually nothing wrong with that. That's actually how it's supposed to be, that I could use judgment because, you know, I don't know, everybody has different faith, but every faith has, has these guidelines, right? But there's no way that some faith that was written a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand years ago could speak to every individual situation, right? So if you're talking to Christians, well, what does Jesus say about social media? nothing because it didn't exist however don't the principles apply and you can use some common sense around it right and so um everything's not evil everything's not bad i think a lot of stuff that people try to demonize it comes down to the way we use it our relationship with it whether it is um food or money's a big one but i think social media is the one that people tend to demonize often and if it didn't exist, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. We wouldn't have a way to find these like-minded people that we feel such a good connection with. So I think intuition is like, it almost comes down to like a better word for common sense because you know, people would use that a lot. I don't hear it as much. I think a dif different generation would use it, uh, talking to us probably. Um, you can't really have common sense until you've had experiences. You can't tell a five-year-old use common sense. But you might say it to a 30 year old because you assume they've had a certain amount of knowledge over the years that has led them to, you know, where they are today. Um, and so I think that's the same again, just like listening to your intuition and then having these uh, really affirming experiences where you listened and then the outcome was good or the outcome was at least true. Because sometimes it's not good, right? It's like you get intuition that someone is not good for you or doesn't have your back and finding out doesn't feel good but it, you're verified. You're verified in knowing because I listened, then I was saved, you know, this amount of this and that. So an example for me would be um, a job that I got in engineering about two years ago. And I pretty much felt like this is kind of something in between. I, 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 love, I love engineering, but this isn't particularly one that lights me up. And, but at the same time, you know, I, you know, I got laid off. I don't want to be laid off for too long. So I'll take it. I feel like there's more out there, but I don't have time. I need to make money. But then over the next few days of me verbally saying yes over the phone, I just didn't feel good about the decision. But then I was like, well, I can't say no. I don't have anything else lined up. And I'd already said no to three other offers. So um, I felt weird. And then the person who was going to be my supervisor called and I felt that was a little bit intrusive because I wasn't starting the job for three weeks. So if you don't work, I don't work for you yet, then you should probably maybe email me and say, hey, is there a time to talk? So I answered and it was like this stern tone immediately. You know, Fifi, I just want to let you know, when you come into this office, you need to know, no tank tops, no logo tees, no shorts. And I'm like, who is she talking to? What is happening right now? And it was so shocking because I'm further along in my career where like, you don't have to do that. But even if I was like fresh out of college, there is uh, an employee manual where you have that information and you have that employee sign it. There's actually no reason that you need to like personally lecture the person unless they're in the situation. So that felt funny to me. And then a couple of other things were said and the phone call ended and I was like, I still don't feel great about it. Um, and so the next day I just woke up and said, I don't have anything lined up. I don't know how I'll make it, but I'm going to, um, you know, tell them no. That same day, I got an email from them saying, hey, the offer letter, it came back with no signature. And so I said, this is my, this is my little in. So I told them, I said, hey, you know what? I've had some time to think about it and I'm actually not going to be able to accept the offer after all. And uh, another thing that confirmed for me was their response was rude. 
<laughs> so I was like, you know, I sent them a professional message. It's a month before the job so they can still look for someone else. And, you know, honestly, even if I gave them a day, if you think about it, companies will get rid of you at a moment's notice, right? So they were rude. And then I felt good because that confirmed like, yeah, this isn't a place I want to work. And then about four hours after that, I got the email for the type of job I would want. And it was just to say, hey, could you come in and have a conversation next week? And maybe the email was coming either way, but it felt good to listen to my intuition and to be completely mm. freed up and know that I did it without knowing anything was lined up um, and to be able to step into that role. I really love how you didn't allow guilt to make you stick with it. Sometimes we, we talk ourselves into saying, well, I did kind of give them a yes. So mm -hmm. therefore I owe it to them to give them two years of my life. Like, right? It's so easy to do that. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. One of the things I, I love about your following you on social media is you, you post a lot of great tweets, a lot of great Instagram, your own quotes. And there are so many times where I'm just reading these things and I'm thinking, what, what was she thinking about when she wrote that? What was she observing in the world when she wrote that? And so this this is my chance to kind of find out. I, I would like to know, uh, to have you riff on either context or maybe just give me some additional thoughts on how to apply it. So I'm gonna bring up a few tweets here and we'll just go okay. through them. That sound cool? Yeah, that sounds good. All right, let me get them going here. All right, number one. I don't even tell people don't stay there too long when they are down because who am I to decide on the timeline of their healing? Yeah, so that one was actually a bit controversial. Not everybody agreed. And then some people in the comments were like, uh, I say that all the time, should I not? <laughs> so um, what it was for me is that uh, I am often the person giving comfort to others. I am the friend that people call uh, when, you know, something has just freshly gone down. And so I was just evaluating just the way those conversations go, especially because when I'm on the receiving end, I don't always feel the same amount of comfort because people are just not used to usually because I just, I don't know, I'm pretty even keel. I think people are like, wait, you're having a down day. So they kind of don't know what to do. But beyond that, I think so many of us have received tough love that even though we know it doesn't feel good. That's literally the only like tool we have to use is that tough love. And so um, when it came to a friend going through a breakup, I was trying to comfort her and it was almost like she was dismissing herself and saying, well, anyway, I, I can't stay down too long. You know, I've got to move forward. And I'm thinking it just happened today. You, you know, why mm -hmm. do we have to think about the future moment? We, I am all about living in this present moment. And if this present moment sucks, it is okay to say that. And as friends, can we just sit with people more often in that? I'm not saying I have to have a bad day because they are, but can't I at least say, mm -hmm. I agree, friend, this sucks. You, you know, breaking off an engagement is not easy. You know, you were planning to move forward. This is hard. I know you probably don't know right now, but when you know what you need, can you let me know so I can support you? You know, the language of don't stay there too long kind of bothers me because it's almost like we're not allowed to have that moment. And if we do, we're negative. But I recently heard someone say, you need to deal with the negative emotions to move to the positive ones. And I like that. Instead of just like pushing them to the side because they may come back up later, it's like deal with it. And so I just was thinking of the grief, just normal everyday grief and how we dismiss ourselves and how we dismiss others and by saying, don't stay there too long. Like, I just feel like we're, we're forcing them into this future moment that, you know, we don't even know how that's gonna go over these next you know, few days of the person dealing with it, maybe we need to just deal in that moment. And even if we have nothing just to say, also what I've learned to say too is, really wanna be there for you, but I also don't want to you know, upset you further. So I'm here to listen. And then if there's something more you need and you think of it, please let me know. That way, instead of just like shying away from them, I just you know, say, I, I, don't, I just don't wanna you know, kind of mess up this healing process, but I do wanna be present for you. Mm. So often the need to say, hey, you need to move on is just our way of saying, I'm so uncomfortable with what you're going through that I need to yes. move on. <laughs> right? yes. I, I want to get you, get you <laughs> over this so I don't have to be, you know, tense. Yeah. Right. I'm going to go to the, the next uh, next quote here. Mm -hmm. Really powerful insights here. My greatness is not measured by my ability to withstand pain. 
So for me as a black woman, I think that that's something that people will comment on often. You're so strong. You know, you, I just, I really admire you. You're able to do so much. And I think sometimes people take that as a compliment, but if you think about it, sometimes the people complimenting you are people who need to be stepping in and helping. <laughs> so they're able to partake in um, the person's reliability and, you know, amazingness, but also not help. And this is kind of related you know, for me, I wrote that from a personal level, but a pet peeve I have is sometimes I see husbands write these posts about their wife and they will list a whole bunch of things that their wife does, including she's doing something right now and they're taking a picture and posting it on IG instead of helping. And it's like, she wakes up at 3 a.m. and does this, she does that, she's amazing. I don't deserve it. I, you know, and it's like, I just wish more often instead of celebrating people for their strength and ability to think ahead that we step in and said, you know, can you kind of explain to me how you did that so I can take that on? So I can, you know, and not seeing it as like helping, but seeing it as a true partnership. Um, you know, I think sometimes that's the kind of language that I just find to be a bit like, I mean, I think you think you're celebrating this person, but even in this photo, they are overwhelmed and you are posting to say, I don't, you know, I don't always do as much as I, sh I should, but thanks for loving me anyway. Like that's, really not it's kind of not great in my opinion so i just think more often um people who are doing a whole lot even though they look really good doing it and they're doing such a great job people around them close friends different people maybe need to be stepping in and saying is there something that I, you know i can help to offload because you're doing a whole lot and it looks great but i i would love to be able to help or teach me how to do that so you don't have to do this other thing I'm not hearing sound. There we go. That one really speaks to me, Fifi, because for much of my life, I think I dealt with a lot of uncooperative circumstances by just doubling down on self-determinism. And I became the kind of person who sent a strong message to the universe and everybody around me, no matter what you throw at me, no matter what you do to me, no matter how much I fail to get what I want, I am only going to affirm the best in life, the best in others, and the best in myself. And that's powerful. And that can get you through a lot of dark days. But there came a point where I, I had to challenge myself to start thinking about actually winning and to start <laughs> defining my greatness, not in terms of how positive and constructive okay. you can be when you lose, but how creative you can be in actually winning. And, yes. and and that can be a form of like fearing success, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very that true. Fearing success. Wow. If, if I could chime in, also, I think a lot of men. That's a very masculine way of approaching things, right? Of just thinking, you know, despite what happens, I will persevere. Despite you know all these things getting thrown in my face, and despite the ability to me realistically like being hurt by these certain things like that a normal person would you know feel this impact and i think it's i think you know a lot of my friends myself you know other uh, masculine figures who are in my life i think have embraced this kind of mentality that um i'm i'm a superman i'm above you know the average and that despite what's kind of thrown at me, my greatness is measured by my ability to get back up and keep fighting the fight. And I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, it's it's a challenging, like, you know, you said the last one was controversial. I think this one is controversial. I think this is, this goes against the common um, narrative. This goes against what we're taught, I think, a lot of times as, as young boys. And, and I think it's, mm -hmm. it's tough to find that balance when your entire life, you're told that, you know, your strength is dependent on how you're able to get back up once you get knocked down. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Wow. Uh, I think there's just a lot of vulnerability that we have left to step into. And I always say calculated vulnerability because you can't just be just this bleeding heart. You know, there are spaces that you're not safe in and that's where your intuition ties in. 
um, but with your partners, your best friends, your closest colleagues that you work with, your, your coaches, those should be people that you're able to be vulnerable with. And even the small stuff, like people maybe using certain language that doesn't feel good to you, you need to be able to say, I don't like that. That doesn't feel good to me. Instead of this, like, I'm going to brush it off. Nothing bothers me. I don't want to show weakness to say that this hurts my feelings or offends me. So I'm just going to shrug it off. But you really don't shrug it off because there's some underlying passive aggressive behavior that always comes back out. And so um, there's just, again, like this calculated vulnerability that I think we can step into even more. Um, and it's, it's hard. Sometimes when you're vulnerable with people you care for and they don't necessarily get it right, it feels like that's why I don't even do that. And I'm going to shut back down again, but actually holding space for yourself and saying, you know, I actually wasn't done talking about that. I actually want to come back to that. Um, it's, it's powerful instead of just saying, well, they brushed me off, you know, or whatever the situation is. Sometimes Fifi, I, I think, I think it can be scary to do that because if the other party isn't gracious, Mm -hmm. They can take advantage of an opportunity to just smash you, right? I mean, so I imagine, um, especially, especially amongst guys, right? I, I imagine putting myself in a situation where I say, hey, <laughs> I, can't even, I can't even say it. I can't even say it right now. <laughs> I can't even say it. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you take it from here, Fifi. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, look. So Jesus take the will. <laughs> listen, I got you. I think definitely that's there's 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 nuances to all this, and I, I definitely am coming from a place of feminine energy, right, for a lot of what I'm doing. But can we also acknowledge that even in men and women, we have that balance of masculine and feminine energy? I just was trained from an earlier age to tap into mine. Right, and it's actually a really beautiful thing. The part of you that is nurturing is the same part of you that is vulnerable because you are nurturing to others and then the vulnerable part allows you to be nurtured by others. And so even if you can't necessarily use the language yet, your first step is in your own head saying, I don't like when people do that, that actually offended me because some people won't even admit it to themselves when certain things bother them. You know, I'm just gonna stay on this sort of area about offense because I mean, there's a million things that go wrong, but you know, just with language, there are certain things, there's certain joking and teasing we don't actually like, but we just don't say anything. And then we're just like, no, 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 there's bigger things in the world. But if we don't teach people those things, we don't use certain language to let them know, yeah, I really do not care for that. They, they just are gonna keep doing it. They are going to keep doing it. And then you never reach those levels of closeness that you may be meant to reach. And um, you have to also be willing to almost like give people a template. I have a, a close family member who um, just, you know, some people are not, um, they're not very soft with it. Like they're giving caring words, but they're kind of like rough, you know, tough love, that kind of thing. And I had to say, I don't, I don't like that. And he said, what do you expect me to say? And so I literally said, you can say, if I'm sharing something with you, this is what you can say. Like anything beyond that, like for instance, have you ever heard someone say, I don't know what to tell you? You know, and it's like, you, no one wants to hear that when they're going through things. So instead you can say, I hate that you're going through this because what it is, I've noticed with my dad, my uncles, different people, if they see me going through something, they get like kind of angry about it. But sometimes it can seem like they're like mad at me, but they're really just upset that I went through something. So changing the language to, I hate that you're going through this is the truth. That's what it is. Sometimes you feel powerless to help the people around you. So you sometimes have to give people a bit of a template and let them know this is more helpful. Um, you know, or, or for instance, if you share something like, say you shared, like you got a flat tire or something, instead of reacting, sometimes we just have to say, how do you feel about that? What's going on now? You know, that kind of things, just to let the person talk instead of jumping into solution mode or saying, well, that's why I wouldn't have gotten that Tesla anyway, or whatever, you know, like, just letting people, um, giving people a template so that they can hold space for you. It's really awkward at first, but I found that it's really, really helpful. And I know with guys, like, it's hard. Like, it's really hard to talk about stuff. And there are a lot of men that I know, they really don't talk to anyone, but their significant other. You know, everybody else doesn't really know. But if there are other people that you're talking to on a daily basis, you need to give them the, the tools to support you, to love you, and to be respectful of you. 
Otherwise, you're putting yourself in harm's way every single day. There may be, they may be saying or doing certain things that are harmful to you, and then you're having to shield yourself. And so you don't have an authentic relationship with them. So step one is just at least admit it to yourself, but eventually start to develop that language to say, I don't really care for that and make it firm and don't like, don't add that LOL at the end of the text. I hate when people do that. Are you, do you mean it or not? Say it, just put that period at the end and own it and allow for the silence because people do need to process. This comes down to boundaries, set better boundaries with yourself, set better boundaries with the people around you. You're going to have more peace. That's going to be the byproduct. I don't really like that. I don't care for that. Come on, I don't really like that, brother. <laughs> we good, man. Me and you good, brother. I promise. I promise you. Man. All right, I got a couple of more here that I want to read. You'll never have enough information to ensure your journey is without pain or hardship. It's not possible. Move forward in faith anyway. So I'm speaking to the perfectionist in me and the perfectionist in everyone else that is saying, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to launch a podcast, I'm going to get on that dating app. I'm going to apply for jobs again, but they haven't done it. They keep saying they're going to because they are trying to get all the ducks in a row. They're trying to make it so they don't fail, that they don't feel any pain. And I absolutely empathize that because I'm so sensitive and it hits me so hard. And I'm that person that's like, that happened because of who I am. You know, I sometimes internalize it, but we need to be reminded we cannot avoid the pain. And that's not a reason not to start. Don't delay when like your book could be amazing. Your, you know, new career could be amazing. Your new relationship could be amazing. And you are just holding yourself back because you don't want to feel pain. But then it's painful holding yourself back because you have something inside of you that needs to be out. And so I just wanted people who read it to be like, okay, the diet that, you know, I've started my diet 12 times and failed. And that's why I don't want to start again because, you know, I don't want to fail again. No, start again. Like that's 12 times you started something new. It's 12 times you took a mm -hmm. chance on yourself. So, mm -hmm. you know, just, I, I have empathy for the pain. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I hate that we have to get rejected or go through things, but if we can go beyond that, there, there is a yes, eventually, you know, there is something good that's going to come out of it. And I just, this year, we didn't know that we would be where we are right now. I was pretty like pessimistic by saying the pandemic will die down by July or August. And then when we got to July or August, I was like, actually, no. And so a lot of stuff that we plan to do, we're not really able to do, or at least in the same way. So that should teach us to just like jump on what we have an opportunity to jump on while we can, because sometimes the opportunities go away. Like I had a podcast uh, episode idea and it's not that I procrastinated. I just was too tired. I overworked in other areas. I got up to write it the next day and it just wasn't there. You know, it's just so interesting. Like when ideas come to us, when opportunities come, you can barely give it a split second thought sometimes. Sometimes you really do just need to like move on it and just know that everything you were doing before this moment is preparing you so you're ready and just take a chance and mm. then improve as you go. I would very much like to hear TK talk on this as well, because, I, you know, I was again before this this episode even started, I was reflecting on that just in my own journey and, and the, my own kind of side projects that I'm working on. And I think what I do appreciate about TK and and how he's and how we've developed this product thus far, even though it stresses me out sometimes, but it's his ability to just create, just create, create, create relentlessly, like despite whether it looks good despite whether it sounds good like he is going to turn it on every day and he's just going to go and so I, i'd love to hear you kind of riff on you know your experience with that and, and how you lead your life that way yeah i think i think most people see creativity as a success oriented process where the primary goal is to get a result and if they don't achieve that result then they failed and I think it's healthier to see creativity as a dis discovery oriented process where the primary goal is to find something new. It's to explore, it's to embark on an adventure that's gonna increase your level of self-knowledge and self-confidence. And so if you have a love for learning, engaging the creative process is like reading a book. 
it's like listening to a podcast. You don't you don't wait until you're worthy to listen to a podcast. You don't you don't say, you know what, I'm going to wait until I understand that subject before I read that book. No, reading the book is how you understand the subject. Listening to the podcast is how you learn the information that's in the podcast. And it's the same with creativity. You know, when you when you reduce the risk in your mind, oh, no, what I create is going to be permanent. And if it's not perfect, people will remember me for that one thing forever. And you say, my goal is to grow. My goal is to actualize myself. Creativity helps you with that. And I, and I think the biggest thing in my personal life that helped me kind of get over myself in that regard was several years ago, inspired by Seth Godin, I decided to do what I called an experiment in personal development where I wrote a blog post every day. And I committed to, I said, it don't matter if it's bad. It don't matter if I like it. I got to hit that publish button before I go to sleep. And you show up for 365 days and you write no matter what kind of day you're having, you are not going to be good most of the time. I just don't think it's possible to be, be good most of the time. And you learn really quickly that when you ship something that isn't perfect, most people don't even care. Most people don't even notice. It's actually a luxury and a privilege to be criticized, you know, and you just realize that it's not that big of a deal to be bad. And then once you're once you're willing to be bad enough to be good, that's when you can start making progress. That's my take on it. Whew. Uh, can we talk about that, though? Because the idea that it's not that good to be bad is foreign for people who are any of the people that are BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, that group has been told that you are not allowed to be in these spaces unless you are excellent. So every time you go somewhere, I'm sure you, you've experienced it, whether you were in uh, the workplace or the college, there, there's few people of color, few Black people, and the ones who are, they are the absolute top pick. It's like, we're never yeah. allowed to be beginners. We're never allowed to just make a mistake and not be reminded, hey, we let you into this space now, you know, make sure you don't mess up too much. You got a seat at the mm -hmm. table, but you know, it's not permanent. And so yeah. I think that's what's so powerful about us being able to create these platforms, having podcasts, having blogs and different things where we are the creative director, the founder, the CEO of all of it, so that uh, someone else is not then telling us, if you're not excellent at every step of the process, you are unworthy. Um, that's not coming from nowhere. That's not coming from internal. It's coming from externally being told, you're not supposed to be in this space. So you need to be the top 3% of everywhere you go. You know, And I don't think that that's good. And I think that if in these spaces, we can reinforce that you're allowed to be like average at it, like we can just decide one day, like, okay, I want to like, be into sculpting clay and it doesn't even have to be for a purpose doesn't have to be monetized doesn't have you know just could literally be because i want to learn um we're not yeah. often given that space and then often when you see a person of color a black person anybody who's rare in that space they have this weight of i'm representing my mom and my dad and my aunties and the people who flunked out of school and all these things so um just creating space to be average or just terrible at something um is such an, an honor. And I love um, the fact that we can even talk about this. And I can even say when I look at some of my old episodes or even images I posted, they weren't great, but like, guess what? I showed up and that was it. Yeah, I, I love that. And you know, I think something that can maybe help, help more people kind of embrace this path is, is to, to maybe point out that the, the concept of excellence that you talked about, that's somebody else's definition of excellence. And we, we should even put that in quotes. And it's a kind of excellence that neutralizes our personalities. It neutralizes our style, our eccentricity, our culture. The very things that make us provocative and interesting and disturbing and memorable, it neutralizes that. And so what are we giving up in order to attain this form of excellence that becomes our permission slip to enter into spaces that make us miserable. We're not only creating spaces where we can be ourselves, but we're creating spaces where we can embody a form of excellence that's actually worth worth pursuing, you know? Man, love it. Fifi, we're gonna close out on one more. I got one more. I, I got more than one more, but I'm just gonna do one more. <laughs> okay. We work on ourselves to improve the quality of our lives, not to make ourselves more lovable. We are already worthy of love. Yeah, so 
it seems like lately I've been on kind of a kick about perfectionism, and that's because that's something I'm still working through uh, because it manifests in so diff so many different ways. But also that was sort of like my resistance to um, what people will say sometimes. So for instance, the last time I got laid off, uh, the first thing someone said to me was to consider going back to school. And it was like, okay, but I, I already have a master's degree in engineering, so I need to get another master's degree or another PhD to then be worthy to re-enter the workplace. How about layoffs happen? Companies don't have the money to pay people's salaries sometimes, and you end up you know, back in the workplace. And yes, sometimes you have to pivot. Like for instance, if I decided I wanted to be a nurse, there's specific training that goes into that. But this person was talking about project management. Do you know how much project management you learn as an engineer? That's that's your whole job. You're managing projects. And so there are certain things we are maybe stuck on right now. And we're not realizing our skills are transferable. We're so much more ready for uh, parenting and marriage and a new business and moving to a new city than we realize because there are other skills that we gained along the way. It's not more, more learning that is going to then make us worthy. If we choose to learn more, it's because we're curious about a part of ourselves, or we've heard something good about this author. But the, the big thing too, I see a lot is like with single people, it's like, well, if you don't do the work on yourself, you know, and I did the work and it's like, come on, you were 19 when you got married. You didn't even know what the work meant. You know, we, Timing is something we don't understand the timing. And I think maybe we can say that more often than not. I don't know why things happen the way they are, what, the way they do. You know, instead of having this answer for everything that it's because you need another certification, you need more schooling, you need more qualification. There, I mean, the people who own the business, for instance, they took a chance on themselves. They don't know how to do every job that's in their company. They took a chance. They had the resources. The timing worked out perfectly. And so just reminding people, even when they're on my page, not to be hard on themselves when they read something that kind of strikes a chord with them. If you're curious about it, dig in deeper, figure out why it upset you or angered you or saddened you, but don't see it as until I master this, until I fully heal, then I'm not worthy of that thing that I desire most. And I just basically, I think a lot of times I just post for myself because I'm, you know, one to always want to do the work, but like, that work is not going to be why I step into the things I prayed for, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Fifi, if people want to follow you or engage more of your work, what's the best place? For, where's the best place for them to go? I would say Divine Hostess, which is my Instagram. And from there, you can find links to my podcast, my Patreon, my website. Um, I'm pretty active also on Pinterest. We talked before about um, you know, just really guarding our hearts and minds. And that platform has been a huge source of creativity and inspiration. So I'm on there as well, Divine Hostess. And I'm always creating content across the platforms. So you can also um, go to my website. And when you go there, just subscribe to my email list. So you can kind of get those updates. But I'm just so excited to be growing the community and just encouraging more people. Well, if there's anything we can do to help support the work that you're doing, which is obviously really good work, don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, we got you back here at the Rev One and we appreciate you joining Thank us today. You. Thank you.